in thinking about the monk's tale, we saw the problem of tragedy. Now, tragedy, remember, according to John of Garland, is about the misfortune of people in higher states falling, but falling in the elevated high style. That means comedy, then, is a humorous poem beginning with sadness, ending in joy, and by inference written in a lower style. Now, of course, that inference is just a supposition. Dante's Commedia, for example, goes from hell to heaven, but is written in a high style, worthy of that climb. But the idea is that the material of a text will determine its style. Now, what do we do with the nun's priest tale? It's an animal fable, a story about animals, but instead of the simple style, we get elements of the high style. Now, Chaucer takes a short poem by Marie de France and turns it into something long, filled with exempla and digressions on dream theories. That's, that's where that comes from the Roman de Renard, as well as references to Cicero's Dream of Scipio and Macrobius's commentary on Scipio, text that we ran into when we were looking at the Parliament of Fowls. And then there's also the wife of Bath's competing octoris in defining the meaning of a dream. Is it the product of humors, in other words, physical causes? Or is it vanity? Or is it meaningful and prophetic? Now, Chanticleer has had a nightmare and his hen, Pertilote gives him some help. Dreadeth no dream, I can say you no more. Madame, quote he, grant merci of your lore. But nonetheless, as touching Don Caton of Cato, that hath of wisdom such a great renown, though that he bad no dreams for to dread, he said, don't fear dreams. By God, men may in old books read of many a man more of autorite than ever Caton was, so must I thee, that all the reverse saying of this on dance, they say the complete opposite, that had well founded by experience, thinking of the wife of that, that dreams being significaciones, they have meaning in their signs. Chaucer even contextualizes Perdelot's theory inside a tale about two friends going on a trip in a boat. It's a tale within a tale. I set not a straw by thy dreamings, for swiveness dreams being but vanities and japes. Men dream all day of owls or of apes, and of many a maze therewithal. Men dream of thing that never was nor shall. There's even a discussion on foreknowledge, in other words, Boethius. But what I want to focus on is Chanticleer's use of language. Chanticleer, like our seat in Palamon, has a courtly bearing. And the text is filled with the topoi of of a morphine or love poetry. For example, the rooster's natural or instinctual crowing is represented as singing. And so, like Arcita in The Knight's Tale, or even Absalon in The Miller's Tale, Chanticleer sings too, because he's inspired to sing out of love for his hen, Perdelote. He loved her so that well was him therewith, in switch a joy was it to hear him sing, when that the bright sun began to spring in sweet accord, 
My leaf is fair and long. My beloved has gone away. That's the song he sings, a very popular Middle English song. That a rooster can express such notions of love is explained by Chaucer when he notes, for thilk time in those days, as I have understood, beast and brids could speak and sing. In other words, the priest can understand his courtly-like song not because he has a magical ring like Canacy in the Squire's Tale or a dream like in the Parliament of Fowls. It's funny when Chanticleer drops all his love talking and complains about women. That's the comedy, right? That's not tragedy. And Chaucer defends its inclusion after setting aside a discussion on Boethius and predestination to the problem of counsel. In other words, in direct contradiction to Melaby. My tale is of a cock, as ye may hear, that took his counsel of his wife with sorrow. He should not have trusted her theory of dreams. Women counsel's been full oft cold, Women's counsel brought us first to woe. Think of, that's a funny etymology of women. Woe to men, womanous woe. And made Adam out of paradise to go, thereas he was full merry and well at ease. Adam shouldn't have listened to Eve. I mean, we're in Jenkins territory now. And then Chaucer creates a funny defense. But for I not to whom it might displease, if I counsel of women would blame, pass over, for I say it in my game. Read octors, where they treat of switch mater, and what they say of women ye may hear. In other words, Jenkins' book, it's the wife of Bath. These been the cook's words, and not mine, I can none harm of no women divine. Don't blame me, but a rooster who turns his hen from a courtly lady into a wife in that comical sense is no Avaragus in the Franklin's tale, who's all nobility and gentilessa. Chanticleer is vain. He's like Jack Benny or Andre Johnson in uh, Blackish. Chanticleer's vanity comes out when he's asked to counterfeit his father's singing style by the fox. Do you remember the physician's tale? Virginia's discourse is so pure that there is no counterfeited terms. Compare that to Chanticleer. Now singing, sir, for Saint Charité. Let's see, can you your father counterfeit? Beware. Um, the fox is a flatterer. He is a losonjor. Now, the moment he's caught, when the fox swings his body over his shoulder, because foxes are always swinging. If you look at pictures of foxes in the Middle Ages, the, they're always holding the neck of a goose or rooster or whatever, and they're thrown over the shoulder as they run. That's how they steal chickens. This is, this is another funny part. The nun's priest calls upon Joffrey of Vonsoff, the great rhetorician, to aid him in his storytelling. Now, we already discussed Joffrey of Vonsoff and his theory of description or descriptio when we talked about the Book of the Duchess, how a description, do you remember, begins from the head and then goes down to the toes because according to Joffrey of Vonsoff, beauty descends from on high. Chaucer makes reference to the beginnings of the Poetria Nova, or the New Poetics as it was called in the medieval period, Ars Poetica, or Manual on How to Write Poetry, in the section on amplification or amplificatio. This is where you're supposed to expand your discourse and make it bigger. And Joffrey of Vonsoff uses an example, a sorrowful complaint about the death of Richard the Lionheart. And he uses it 
to show many different kinds of figures, including how to write or use apostrophes. Apostrophes are those O's that we saw in the Man of Law's tale. Those emotional appeals to an audience that is not present. In other words, to absent figures or absent historical people, people who are dead. And you use that as a way to delay your text. Now, in his treatment of amplification, Joffrey of Vonsoff writes, do not allow your discourse to proceed through the material, but go around it with wide digressions, right? Show your pace, thus bestowing expansion on your words. Now, this use of apostrophe is one of the examples. Oh, Goffred, oh, Joffrey of Ansoff, dear Maester Sovereign, that when thy worthy King Richard was slain with shot, complainedest his death so sore. That's a reference right to the Poetria Nova. Why ne had I now thy sentence and thy lore? Why, why can't I, why do I not have your meaning in your learning? The Friday for to chide as did in ye, for on a Friday soothly slain was he. Then would I show you how that I could plain, for Chanticleer's dread and for his pain. If I had your skills, I would really show you how Chanticleer is complaining. What's funny is that in Richard's discourse, or illustration in Joshua Vonsoff's Poetria Nova, Venus is also appealed to when Joffrey writes, O Venus lacrimoso dies, O sorrowful day of Venus. Now look at Chaucer's appeal. O Venus that art goddess of Plaisance, since that thy servant was this Chanticleer, and in thy service did all his power more for delight than world to multiply, why wouldst thou suffer him on thy day to die? Shouldn't Venus be protecting her servant of love? Another figure that's in this play on Joffrey of Vonsoff is description, descriptio, which we just talked about a few minutes ago, that description that goes from head to toe. Look at, look at this funny example in The Nun's Priest Tale. His comb, you know the red part of a rooster. His comb was redder than the fine coral, and batide, batide is like, you know, the castles all have those, those crenellated little wall type tops and betide as it were a castle wall his bill was black and as the jet it shone like azure were his legs and his tone his nails whiter than the lily floor and the lily floor is also one of mary's images and like the burned gold was his color that's funny and of course digression or digressio that's the entire text the entire text is filled with digressions so what do you say about using Joffrey of Vonsoff to amplify an animal fable? The tale ends on an interpretive note on the question of exegesis. As of a fox or of a cock and hen taketh the morality good men for St. Paul saith that all that written is to our doctrine, it is a right and a wis, taketh the fruit and let the chaff be still. In other words, take the essence of the text, that's the interpretation, and let the chaff, what's left over, in other words, the words, be still, I'll left alone. Interpret for meaning, ignore the textual surface, the spirit lives, the letter kills. You remember that from the Sumner. Don't be literal. In other words, sure, this is a fable, but it has meaning, and we can learn from animals. That's what fables tell us. In our next episode, let's look at the second nun's tale. All right, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.